and um, Katie will spend some time introducing herself, but just a little basic background. She's a licensed psychologist. She practices in Bellingham, Washington, and she has been a member of the Bellingham Whatcom County Commission on Sexual and Domestic Violence, which is where I worked for many years. Um, she still is a member and was before, um, for about 10 years or seven years before. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie and she will be um, the presenter for the rest of the time. And feel free to yeah, message the panelists, raise your hand, message me or Michelle directly if you need anything to participate. Wonderful. Thanks, Susan. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my um, presentation right before we jump in. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. <coughs> So uh, hopefully you're in the right place. We're learning about vicarious trauma today. And this presentation is geared towards managers, towards supervisors. Uh, I can see that um, some of you are not in that role as a manager or supervisor. This will still hopefully be relevant to you. And you can learn a bit about um, how vicarious trauma might be affecting you right now or in the future and some preventative efforts as well. Um, so I see that there's a note that I'm, my volume is a little bit soft. If you can't hear me, um, go ahead and let us know in the chat. We can figure something out, I'm sure. But I'm going to chug on. Hopefully um, you all can hear me. Um, okay, so let's jump in. We're um, going to start with a brief introduction. I'm just going to share a tiny bit more about myself and my background. Um, I will share some definitions of certain terms, terms that we're probably all familiar with, but maybe we don't um, understand the nuances and how these terms are different from each other. It can just help us better understand vicarious trauma um, to understand the background of all of these terms that we commonly use when we're working in the helping profession. Um, I'm also going to talk about some risk factors to vicarious trauma and the impact, the potential impact that it can have on folks. And then, of course, we'll talk about organizational strategies, what to do uh, to prevent, to mitigate vicarious trauma and some related experiences as well. Uh, so as Susan mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist. I have a private practice here in Bellingham, Washington. Um, my specialty is in working with trauma, with interpersonal violence. The majority of my clients, um, they have some sort of history with uh, sexual assault, domestic violence. They might have had trauma in their childhood, such as child sexual abuse. And I work with adults, so now they're healing from that, um, from those experiences. So some of my clients have traumas that have recently occurred. Um, some of my clients are coming to me as adults and they're only just now talking about what happened in their childhood and, and working to heal from that. So I, I get to work with some pretty amazing people in my private practice. Um, and I feel lucky to work within this field um, and uh, to be able to observe the resilience of survivors. Um, I'm also a non-tenure track faculty member at Western Washington University in their psychology department. Um, teaching remotely has been a really interesting learning experience for me, um, but we're still chugging along here with our uh, classes and um, I'm, I'm enjoying that part uh, as well, even though we're still separate keeping my fingers crossed that in the fall we'll be together again. And as Susan mentioned, I'm a member of uh, the Commission Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. Um, and I got to work with Susan for a number of years, which I also feel lucky about. Um, and we still have a working relationship. As you can see, we're here today together. So uh, you've already gotten this started. Uh, if anyone though hasn't mentioned who they are, where they're from, what their role is, feel free to, to throw that in the chat box. Um, as Susan named earlier, we don't really have enough time to go one by one who you are and do brief inter introductions, but I can see that we've got people from all over the state, which is um, pretty wonderful and unexpected that there are people from other parts of the country too. We've got folks from Georgia, from Arkansas. Um, welcome, welcome. It's really wonderful to see you all here uh, for an hour and a half to learn about vicarious trauma. Um, so I appreciate you spending a part of your afternoon with me today. 
um, welcome to those near and far. So go ahead and continue on with your um, introductions if you'd like to, to put that in before we move on or as we move on. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I want to share some data with you that will not be surprising if, if you've worked in this field for even just a number of months, uh, this data won't be surprising to you. Um, looking at victim advocates, one study found that the rates of secondary traumatic stress is about 50%. So half of victim advocates will experience secondary traumatic stress at some point in their career. And I will talk more about what secondary traumatic stress means in a few slides, but generally it's, it's a negative impact of the work that they do. Looking at social workers in DBSA field, <clears throat> we can see in this study that they found that 65% of social workers exhibited at least one symptom of secondary traumatic stress. So we see that percentage go up a little bit. And then therapists, this is my realm, 70% experienced vicarious trauma, again, at some point in their careers. So the, the main takeaway here is that these effects of the work are expected. They're not exceptions. This is a really important thing that I think we all internalize no matter what our role is. There's nothing wrong with the provider. There's, there's no flaw that the advocate has or the social worker or therapist manager has if they experience something like vicarious trauma or burnout. It is just part of the work that we do. Um, and so we should expect it, even though we expect that it will show up in staff, advocates, employees, doesn't mean that um, we have to be helpless to it. We can actually work to mitigate those effects. And that's the purpose of today is to talk about uh, and learn about how we do that. Um, so there's, there are tons of other studies. If you're interested in learning more about statistics and data, if you're interested in specific populations, fortunately, vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress, burnout, et cetera, these are concepts that have been studied for decades. And so we do have a pretty good amount of data to support that it happens in many realms. Uh, so I encourage you to do some searching if you're interested in learning more about the numbers and if there are other um, providers or settings that you're interested in learning about. Whoopsies. So I'm gonna pause for a little bit of reflection for you to uh, put something in the chat here if you have something to share. Um, thinking about the first signs of burnout that you might notice in your staff as a manager or supervisor, a director, I'm hopeful that um, you all have been paying attention to how your staff is doing and I'm sure that you have some insight to share. So if you could just throw in the chat box, thinking about these are the, the, the things that I notice in my staff that tell me they might be feeling a little bit burnt out. If you're not a manager, supervisor, if you're an advocate yourself, you're a provider, feel free to share what you notice in yourself. What do you notice when you're starting to feel burnt out? And I'll give us a few minutes to, um, to put that in the chat box. We already have some really interesting and helpful perspective. So we see here time off is a big one, um, calling in sick, taking time off, missing deadlines, irritable, avoidance of work, lack of motivation. Oh, wary of new initiatives, ideas, projects. Yeah, like let's maintain the status quo. We don't wanna add anything else. Causes seem to impact more personally. Thanks for sharing that, Lori. We will talk a little bit more about that too. Um, the impact on personal life, cynicism, impatient, avoidance of clients, harder time with boundaries, impact on concentration, gossip and conflict with coworkers, noticing those workplace relationships get strained. 
only spending time with people they work with. Yeah, uh, sort of the flip side of the coin, hyper focus on um, those work relationships. Oops, sorry, I'm clicking away here before we're ready to move on. Withdrawn and less communicative fatigue. Thank you all for sharing your observations. So that it's very helpful for us to think about what are those first signs and Next, of course, we need to think about how we pay attention to them and attend to them, which I'm hoping to share some ideas with you as we go on. And it goes without saying that for managers and supervisors, if you're witnessing those signs of burnout in others, it's helpful to check in with yourself and think about what are your early signs of burnout um, and how do you pay attention to those. Um, certainly, I relate to a lot of these. Uh, as someone who works in this field, I've experienced burnout and vicarious trauma too. Um, and I've tried to get really familiar with my early warning signs so that I can do some self care, take a break, intervene, so it doesn't get worse. Um, because as we will find out, it does or it can get worse for some folks. So looking at the impact of vicarious trauma and burnout, what we see is that there can be a spectrum of responses. And it ranges from positive to negative. So we're going to take sort of a big picture view on how uh, working within this field can impact a person's view from which they look at the world and other humans, which certainly affects them in their work, but as some of you named, it affects them personally too. So starting with the positive end of the spectrum, working within the, the world of trauma, we can see a number of things occurring that are positive, that are beneficial. The, the first two uh, concepts that I wanna talk about are vicarious resilience and vicarious transformation. So these are newer concepts in the literature, <clears throat> but they name that um, providers certainly get something from witnessing the resilience and strength in their clients and survivors. Witnessing that transformation uh, of someone healing from trauma um, feeling empowered again, setting boundaries, um, thriving in their life, that certainly gives us something as providers that's beneficial. Um, this feeling that the work we do matters and people are amazing. So that can be a positive change in our worldview. We also have something that's called compassion satisfaction, which is a great term that um, really summarizes why many of us are in this work in the first place. This is naming that, that we as providers personally get something from expressing compassion and empathy to another human being and feeling a connection in that moment or with that person. It's a reciprocal relationship, right? We, we're empathetic, we're compassionate, we're validating, we're listening, and that person is taking it in. They're getting something um, from that empathy and compassion, feeling that support from us. And so we certainly um, can feel positive effects from that. We can also feel appreciative um, for folks who are recognizing, wow, I am so grateful that, um, that my house is safe, my home is safe, that I have a healthy relationship. It can humble us and allow us to check in and notice our own, um, our own life and, and the benefits um, that we have that might be different from uh, what we're witnessing in our survivors and the people we're working with. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so Michelle, there's a comment. I, is, I'm, I'm not sure if that's to me or <laughs> to someone else. Um, if you can clarify, that'd be great.
Okay, I'm going to move on. So um, in the neutral uh, version of the spectrum, what we see here is that the impact of the work that we do, it's, it's managed through our own individual re resilience and coping strategies and organ organizational practices. So this means that um, there are days that are hard, there are weeks that might be really stressful, we feel depleted, but we're able to refill our cup because we can take breaks, we can engage in self-care and we have our own resilience that we rely on. So this is just naming that for some folks, there's no significantly positive or negative experience um, or response. They're sort of hanging out in this neutral ground, um, which is a great place to be as well because they're um, able to consistently stay engaged in their work um, really noticing the early signs of burnout, attending to them, um, and really preventing themselves from becoming more into that negative side of the spectrum. So that brings us to negative spectrum of responses is when someone might be feeling fearful or cynical. Um, this means that they might be viewing the world as an unsafe place. They've heard stories of trauma. They've heard um, about the horrible things that people can do to each other. And so it's, it's really hard for them to not view the world from that fearful lens. They might also feel cynical thinking, gosh, I just keep trying and trying and trying and nothing I do matters. This will always um, be in existence that there's violence and there's traumatized people. What is the point? Um, so really feeling that burnout there. And that can lead to compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress and vicarious traumatization, which I will now further define. Uh, I'm gonna pause for just a moment. Are there any questions coming up for anyone so far? Um, anything unclear? Okay, great, I'll move on. So here are definitions of terms that I've um, talked about, I've used several times already. So let's clarify what they really mean. Burnout is actually a term that was coined back in 1982. Um, it was a psychologist who coined this term and she was looking at the cumulative stress, the cumulative effects, um, the negative effects that certain settings, workplaces can have on an individual. So she looked at the nature of the job, the job role, the expectations uh, placed on the person within that role, the general setting and the demands. So what are the demands and what's the capacity for the provider? She found that in many settings where the demands were um, higher than what the provider could meet, um, that it caused issues with burnout. Over time, these providers were becoming exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally. And this is in many different settings that she noticed this happening. So it's in our world, our trauma work, but in other areas as well um, with prosecutors, probation officers, nurses, um, really anyone who is working in a, a high demand job um, where they're feeling like they just can't keep up no matter what they do. And so she found that as a result of burnout that some people would use what's called defensive coping strategies. This is essentially naming that when we're burnt out, we're more likely to use coping strategies that are helpful in the short term, but maybe not the long term. So an example um, that I've heard many people mention is that, um, you know, I go home and I have um, a couple glasses of wine every night. That's the only way I can wind down these days. And it's well intended. They want to relax. They want to decompress and maybe distract themselves from their work day. But as we know, um, that can certainly spiral. Um, it's not always the most helpful coping strategy, especially when it's overused. And in the end, 
um, burnout led to a reduced commitment to the profession related to what many of you put in the chat box, calling in sick, requesting more time off, more errors, all of those things that you notice um, can result from burnout. So this was helpful because this was the first time that someone coined a term, researched it, and pointed out that it's not because the provider is flawed. It's actually because of the setting and the context of which they work. Um, Noreen, I see your um, question, and I will actually uh, get to that in a couple of slides um, talking about someone's own trauma and how that can interact with the work. So thank you for that comment. <clears throat> Uh, compassion fatigue is another uh, term that's related to burnout. This is a term that uh, came about in the 90s, and this term actually was coined after research looking specifically at nurses. However, after we had that initial research, we realized that it can be um, it can relate certainly to other providers and settings as well. Compassion fatigue generally is known as the cost of caring. So this is when someone um, is working within this stressful environment, but compassion fatigue names how when we are empathetic, offering compassion, when we care, we are likely to become emotionally depleted. So this is a helpful concept to name. It's not only the workplace, it's not only the organizational structure, but it's actually um, the helping profession that can lead to potential negative consequences. And so as a result of compassion fatigue, someone can feel emotionally depleted, but on the other side of that, someone might feel preoccupied with their clients. They might think about that person that they just saw that day while they're trying to get to sleep at night, or they're off on the weekends and they're ruminating, thinking about um, the clients that they talk to throughout that week, wondering how they're doing. So not being able to set boundaries really between job and personal life, um, thinking about the clients even when they're not at work. So helpful to name that not only is it the setting, but it's actually caring that can make us vulnerable to some negative effects. And then we have secondary traumatic stress. This is a concept that's a bit different from burnout and compassion fatigue, which tend to happen over a period of time. It's cumulative, it can build um, and grow into something that becomes severe. Secondary traumatic stress is something that happens more immediately and it can happen unexpectedly. It can really take someone off guard. So this is when someone, um, hears about, knows about another person's trauma, or maybe they've witnessed trauma. Um, and what happens is that they respond in a way that's similar to having some PTSD symptoms. So they might feel very helpless. They might feel um, all of a sudden isolated in their experience. They can feel hypervigilant, really aware of their surroundings and reactive. Um, to anything that startles them. It can take them a long time to calm down. Really similar symptoms to PTSD. However, it's secondary traumatic stress. So it is a little bit different and we would address it a little bit different as well. So as I mentioned, this can come on abruptly. Um, it can happen without warning and it can be pretty debilitating um, in, a, in, in a quick fashion. So with secondary traumatic stress, really the best way to handle it, to try and offer support and intervention, is to allow that person to take time off work, um, to immediately give them time to process. Um, and that could mean getting in, uh, connected to a therapist or doing some of their own healing work on their own, anything to let the body, the nervous system sort of resettle um, after hearing about that trauma. With burnout and compassion fatigue, time off is helpful as well, of course, uh, but with secondary traumatic stress, we really want to prioritize that so they're given a break, um, given some time to process immediately. And this brings us to vicarious traumatization. This is the definition of that term, the emotional residue 
of exposure that providers have from working with people as they are hearing their trauma stories and becoming witnesses to the pain, fear, and terror that trauma survivors have endured. So you can see it's quite a comprehensive definition that's very much focused on working with trauma. So this is a term that is specific to our field, to the work that we do, um, and thus is very valuable to be aware of and to better understand. Vicarious traumatization results from empathic engagement combined with a commitment or responsibility to help survivors. So again, this, this really names what probably many of us relate to and this delicate balance that we're all trying to find in our work where we are empathetic, we're emotionally attuned, we're connected to the people we work with and we feel a commitment to the work that we do. We're passionate about it. We care deeply um, about this work. And that's making most of us very good at what we do. Uh, but it makes us so vulnerable to vicarious traumatization because it takes, it can take an emotional and energetic toll. So this is the only construct um, that looks at the cumulative long lasting impact on a clinician's personal beliefs and worldview. So naming that, yes, it can be those more mild symptoms of burnout and compassion fatigue, and it can grow into a negative impact on someone's worldview. Of course, that's not how it always happens. Um, and I will name if someone gets to that place where there's a negative worldview, they don't always stay there. Um, they're not stuck there forever. Um, but this names really the comprehensive effects that working within this field can have on us um, and certainly important to pay attention to and keep in mind. Um, vicarious traumatization, another term coined in the 90s. So um, we do have some good research and literature that support it, that, uh, that have looked at it. And it was um, and originally coined by um, some researchers that were working within the Traumatic Stress Institute, interested in knowing really how does this specifically working with trauma, how does that affect providers? Okay, so we know that um, there's some vulnerability. There's some potential consequences uh, in doing the work that we do, but we do this work for a reason because we're committed um, and we're emotionally engaged in it. Let's talk a little bit more about risk factors. Um, and just a reminder, anyone who works with trauma is at risk for negative impact. There's nothing wrong with a person if they experience any of these um, uh, concepts like compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma. So the first risk factor is prior traumatic experiences. This um, relates to a question that one of the participants um, put in the chat box. So having prior trauma can certainly make someone more at risk of a negative impact of the work that they do. And it's because um, what I've read about in the literature and what's been researched is that when someone hears a story that's like their own, it understandably triggers their own memories and can trigger their own emotional reactions. So as human beings, we all do this. We relate ourselves to others. Um, does their story match mine? Are our experiences the same or are they different? So this is a very common experience that we do. With trauma though, it can offer this vulnerability because of course, traumatic memories can be dysregulating and it can cause this emotional energy um, to um, be triggered and intensified when they're working with that survivor. So I read in one piece of literature, it's like the scar of the trauma rubs up against the, their, the client or their survivor's experience. Um, and it's, it's sort of like pointing at that wound again. Now, this doesn't always lead to vicarious trauma, of course. Um, but as I mentioned, what can happen is that, that someone can be more emotionally entangled in the experience. They might have their own emotional reactions that need to be uh, more attended to. 
And if they don't have time to take a break to attend to what's coming up for themselves because of the work setting, that can um, really cause a, an energetic drain on that person. So prior traumatic experiences can act as a risk factor. We also see that social isolation, both on and off the job, acts as a risk factor. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next slide um, because it's particularly relevant to working within a pandemic. Um, but when we're isolated, we don't have people to help us carry the weight, uh, at least not as readily. It's really helpful to be able to pop into your coworker's office and say, wow, that was a tough call, phone call that I had, or that was a tough um, session that I had with a person. Um, that connection with our peers and colleagues is very valuable to have that shared common experience. So when we don't have that, it can act as a risk factor. Personally, if someone has a tendency to avoid feelings, withdraw, assign blame to others, those can be risk factors for vicarious trauma. This makes so much sense. If someone is less aware of their own experiences, their own feelings, they're not noticing the signs of burnout as readily or as easily. Additionally, um, intervening and confronting those signs of burnout, noticing when we're making mistakes, when we're not focused on our work, it requires us to uh, have personal insight and to take responsibility, noticing like, wow, I've been really distracted and I'm making way more mistakes than I usually do. What's going on with me? Um, versus when someone's assigning blame, well, I'm making mistakes and it must be their fault, not mine. It, it just results in someone missing all of those signs. And so the, the co negative consequences of vicarious trauma can grow. If someone has difficulty expressing their feelings, it can result in peers, colleagues, managers, friends, family members, um, maybe not noticing or helping to point out some of those warning signs of burnout or vicarious trauma. Being newer and less, ex less experienced acts as a risk factor. I'm gonna talk a little bit about training um, at the end of today because that's certainly important we wanna know what we're doing and we wanna feel competent. But I want you to also just think for one moment what it was like for you when you first came into this role, when you first came into this field. Um, I know for myself, I had a lot of learning to do around boundaries. How do I set boundaries with my clients? Um, when I go home, how do I set boundaries with my work day? Uh, I had a lot of experience to gain around that so that I could sustain um, my work. Lack of uh, preparation, orientation, training, and supervision can certainly act as a risk factor. And I'm going to loop back to this as well at the end when we talk about strategies, um, ways to mitigate vicarious trauma. It's also unhelpful when there's constant and intense exposure to the trauma with little or no variation in work tasks. Maybe this is something that you all can relate to as well. I certainly remember early in my career um, as an intern and fresh out of grad school, um, my, my jobs were all about just seeing clients one right out of, after another. And we were worked, worked, worked really hard. Um, as someone who was new or as an intern, I felt like I couldn't say no. I couldn't say, hey, I need a break. Um, and so it was just constant. Um, and I was burnt out by the end of that, imagine. Um, so we need variation in work tasks. We need to be able to see clients, meet with survivors, and then do some paperwork. Uh, we need to be able to focus on something administrative. Um, I'll say that uh, in my career, having a private practice and teaching part-time, that gives me a great variation um, in what I do and what I focus on. And I think that's been sustainable for me. So we have to think about that within the organization as well. And then lack of an effective and supportive process for discussing traumatic content of the work. So, you know, not having a supervisor to go to that they trust, uh, maybe related to that social isolation. They don't have colleagues that they can talk to. Um, they don't get to take breaks together, so they don't have those informal conversations about how they're doing. Those are certainly risk factors as well. So I wanna have us pause and do a little bit more reflection here. This is a chance for you to think about what you're already doing. 
um, for those of you who are managers, supervisors, directors, what are you doing to prevent or address one of these risk factors? And I know many of them are related, but maybe you can look at one, think about your organization and type in the chat, um, what have you been doing to address it? Help share some great ideas with other organizations. Um, if you're not in a management role, I want you to think about generally what your organization offers to you as support to address some of these risk factors. Um, one or more of them. So this is a great time for us to be able to share some ideas, to share what you're already doing. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll be sharing um, some um, best practice suggestions so we can see how and if they relate. <clears throat> So I see some suggestions, some actions coming in, um, talking about it in the initial training, checking in as a team, individual supervision, free counseling, that's great that that's available. <clears throat> Debrief, um, allowing staff to talk about experiences. Um, the EAP, Employee Assistance Program, another way to offer support and counseling. Um, Jennifer's naming having time and space for advocates to focus on things that's not direct service. Um, attending community provider meetings, doing extra training, that's great. Getting them to use their brain and their engagement in a different way. So it's not just direct service. That's awesome. Um, weekly one on one, even if things are going smoothly, so important to maintain that consistent connection to demonstrate um, stability of supervision. I'm here for you no matter what. Um, Angie's naming it's helpful that their direct supervisor offers monthly check ins. Um, but it's not the total focus to, where'd you go? Where did that comment go? Um, it's not the total focus to talk about work stuff, talking about how they're doing personally, so valuable because we are human beings, right? We have lives outside of our work and it certainly impacts us in the work that we do. Weekly check-ins, fun events. Training on multiple areas, wonderful. Breaks, debrief. Oh, I love, so Miranda's comment, this is a really um, important one as well. Asking, um, asking if it's okay to unload and debrief before doing that, right? Let's check in with that person and see if they have the capacity to take this in. Um, because we don't want to be contributing to their vicarious trauma. Clinical consult team that meets without supervisor, that's great. Having time with other peers. Having a book club, arts and crafts. Yeah. That's awesome that there are some book clubs. I, I wouldn't have thought about that. Um, so having an opportunity to maybe use a book club to gain more information related to the work that we do, but I'm guessing probably reading books for fun, um, which is wonderful to make time for that as well. Lots of variety here. So thank you all for sharing about what you're already doing. Uh, organizations take note, you know, all of you can learn from each other here and think about how to create some space for some of these action points in your own organization. Um, Tina's naming nonverbal communication sessions each week, using the book and the workbook, that's great. So building some other um, strengths and um, relating that to work, having them practice it, that's awesome. Wonderful. So you're all doing a pretty great job. That's, that's um, great to see and many of that aligns with best practice. So hopefully um, the rest of this pre presentation will build on what you're already doing. So um, another risk factor, right? Remote working. Um, I'm sure you all have been thinking about this and talking about this. 
um, this work environment, working in isolation might be contributing to vicarious trauma. And I say might because we don't have the data yet, but um, I'm sure we will get that data at some point. Certainly as a psychologist, this is a very interesting social experiment that we're all in. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious to know what the ripple effects of this pandemic will be on our field and um, advocates and staff. Thinking about working remotely, uh, we can understand that it's challenging because some of the most satisfying parts of the job are missing. Having that direct service, face-to-face -face connection and engagement with clients and with survivors, some people really value that. That's the most satisfying part of their job, and they, they don't get that in the same way. I would, I, I'm doing telehealth right now with all of my clients. It's working. We're doing, we're doing okay. We're getting good work done, but it's not the same as being in the room together. Um, Although I will say some of my clients uh, prefer telehealth, so kind of interesting to learn from that. There's also a connection to colleagues that we're missing. Um, just the informal conversations that, that we have as we're seeing each other in the hallway or grabbing coffee together or maybe um, doing an afternoon walk, getting a break. Um, we're really, a lot of us are missing that. And so we're feeling that isolation. And then there's also an important piece to name around focus. Um, there are plenty of advocates, staff, managers that are also parents or they're juggling other responsibilities at home and they get interrupted when they're trying to work. So it's really valuable to be able to go into the office for some people and to um, be able to just tune into their work, to, to put on that work role hat and stay there for however many hours they're at the office and then um, you know come home to tend to some of those other responsibilities. So some folks are really missing that too. Um, <clears throat> so we need to think about how we're uh, addressing vicarious trauma related to the, the remote working environment. Um, and I'd be curious to know um, how many of the suggestions you all made in the chat box, how you're adapting that to remote work. I can see how many of them do um, already, you know, having supervision via Zoom, that's an easy way to adapt it. Um, having a book club and ha having book club meetings via Zoom, doing a craft together at home in separate spaces, um, but logging on. So I'm sure you all are adapting and I encourage you to consider, uh, continue to consider getting creative with that. And we'll all just be waiting anxiously for the data to show us what is the impact um, on, on the providers. So there is an impact on work life. I've talked about some of the personal impact. You all have named some of that as well um, at the beginning in terms of signs of burnout. Uh, there can be challenges, of course, with productivity as a result of someone being or experiencing vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue. Um, one is low morale, low, motiva low motivation. Several of you named that that's one of your early warning signs that you pay attention to in your staff. Um, errors in judgment, making small errors, things falling through the cracks. This is something that I really pay attention to when I'm missing some details and making logistical errors. I know that I, my plate is too full. I need to take a step back. Um, increased countertransference can be um, a consequence of vicarious trauma. So countertransference is more of a therapeutic term, um, but it, it certainly relates to um, it, any role uh, that a provider is in, whether they're doing therapy or not. Countertransference is when we are projecting something onto that survivor, onto that client. So maybe that person reminds you of your sister or your brother or a neighbor whatever it is, your parent. Um, and that in itself is not a negative thing, <clears throat> but countertransference when we're not aware of it, we can start to treat that person as if they're our sister, brother, parent, etc. And that can make us um, less objective in the work that we're doing. It can cause us to not give um, the most appropriate support if we're basing it on our own internal reactions to them and not on the actual person. Um, impact on work life, it can cause more conflict with peers, with staff, 
when we're experiencing vicarious trauma, absenteeism, lateness. So several of you named that as well as being one of those early warning signs. If someone is showing up late regularly, calling in sick, that's certainly a sign and um, <clears throat> uh, that's definitely something to pay attention to. Decreased ability to work independently. Uh, you might notice that um, one of the staff members is coming to you more regularly with questions, um, second guessing themselves, they don't have that confidence. And so that can be a sign of vicarious trauma. They might not be trusting of their coworkers, um, not feeling supported by them. They might be spending time looking for another job um, and they might have, uh, they might be contributing to decreased team cohesion and communication. So when we observe these experiences and these challenges, we need to be asking, is vicarious trauma um, part of this picture? It's not always, there could be something completely different going on, of course, um, but these signs point um, that to the fact that vicarious trauma could be likely. So some of you mentioned in the chat when you were sharing strategies that their supervision to check in about work, but you're also checking in about personal life that's so valuable um, because of this picture right here. So we might be thinking that it's vicarious trauma, but maybe something is really going on in their personal life that's having a negative impact on work. And potentially there's something we can do to offer support um, to help with, with that. Um, and certainly if it's vicarious trauma, we can have other strategies to use as well. So we need to be curious about that when we see the impact on work life. <clears throat> so I'm going to shift to talking about some of those specific strategies and becoming vicarious trauma informed. Uh, I'm going to pause again to see if there are any questions, any comments, anything to name before we move on. Okay. I think, I think we're good then, let's move on. So you can see that there are several levels <clears throat> here within this picture of um, being vicarious trauma informed. And of course, we're gonna focus on the organizational level as we move on, but I just wanna note that there are other contributing factors. Um, one is within the individual. So in other presentations I've done um, when the participants, the attendees have been mostly advocates and providers, I'm really focusing in, of course, on the individual strategies. And what lives there, in a nutshell, self-care. How do we practice self-care? How do we prioritize it? Um, and what do we do? We talk a lot about self-care in general. Certainly, it's talked about constantly in, in the work that I do. Um, but it's important to take some time to learn about specific self-care strategies and how we practice self-care on multiple levels. So nourishing ourselves um, physically, getting rest and drinking water and um, eating good foods and um, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves in the, those way, but also nourishing ourselves creatively, nourishing ourselves relationally. So really thinking about self-care on all of those levels is important. And that's, that's a part of the picture here. Um, we wanna encourage individuals to feel empowered, to take care of themselves, to prioritize self-care um, and to set boundaries with work when they need to. Of course, the organization can support that practice. We also need to recognize that the community plays a role thinking about, um, for example, what is the funding? What does support look like for your organization? If you're underfunded, overworked, um, because the community isn't supporting you in the way that you need, that's gonna add um, to vicarious trauma and it's gonna be a challenge to try and overcome. Um, and what kind of community culturally do you, are you living in? Um, what are the norms? What's the awareness around interpersonal violence um, and things like that? So just thinking about those other pieces too, it's not just the organization, uh, of course, but there are lots of things that organizations can do. So this comes from the Vicarious Trauma Toolkit 
um, from the Office for Victims of Crime. I, if you haven't looked at this, I strongly encourage you um, to take some time to go through it. It's very comprehensive, very user-friendly. It gives you a blueprint. Um, these are the things that you should be doing if you wanna be vicarious trauma informed. So I'm not gonna go through, of course, all of the suggestions, but I'm gonna share um, some, <clears throat> some of them that relate to what you've already um, share that you're doing and, and maybe some new ideas as well. Um, but looking at this picture, just thinking we want to hit within all of these categories. So what is our mission? Um, what's the work environment? Management supervision, training, and wellness. All of these areas are essential. There are lots of benefits of organizational support. I'm sure you already know this, but just to build that awareness even more, we do have some research that backs up what our common sense would tell us. Uh, we found that advocates who receive more support from the organization experience lower levels of secondary traumatic stress. It's really important because remember that is the experience um, that can come on abruptly and can cause significant negative impact pretty quickly. So we wanna lower those levels for sure. Of those who did experience vicarious trauma, supportive work environment reduced the negative impact. So naming again, people will experience this, but the work environment can definitely mitigate the negative consequences. Quality supervision enables staff to overcome high workloads and stay on the job. So we know that there are plenty of organizations who are forced to have high workloads. The demand is high. There are many, many survivors that need to be served and we don't always have enough staff. But when we have that support from the supervisor, not only when we're addressing what's going on at work, but we feel safe with that supervisor, we feel respected as a human being, uh, it can really act as a benefit. And then being trained specifically in vicarious trauma benefits the participants and the populations they serve. So thinking about training, not only we want them to be competent in their role uh, and work-related tasks, but we want them to have some time to build awareness and understanding of vicarious traumatization. So many, many benefits. The research backs it up. So let's think about um, some specific strategies. And thank you, Michelle, if you haven't seen that already, um, she put the link to the toolkit in the chat box. Okay, so let's think about the work environment. <clears throat> Sorry, my dog is barking. This is what happens when we work from home. <laughs> so, Hopefully that's not too distracting, I'm sorry. I'm gonna continue on. So a healthy work environment fosters teamwork. We have collaboration. Um, thanks for your uh, normalization, Michelle. <laughs> um, and we have that collaboration and teamwork inside and outside the organization. So um, thinking about what are the things that we do together within the organization, certain tasks, uh, projects that we're working on, but we also want to offer a chance to collaborate with people in other organizations, in other roles, um, so we can, of course, build some different relationships with them, but also get some new insight, um, new perspective. We want to create opportunities for staff to connect, and some of you gave some great examples of how you're doing that informally and formally, and of course, opportunities to diversify job tasks. Again, um, a couple of you pointed that out in the chat box. So you're already doing that. Um, so if you're not doing any of these things or you're doing one or the other, I encourage you to think about what this looks like for you. What is a healthy work environment and how can you make that better for your staff? And thanks, Angie, for your comment as well. I love it when cats are crawling around in the background. Um, it's pretty fun to meet our little pets. <clears throat> 
So I talked about quality supervision, feeling safe and respected. What does that really mean? Well, um, one way we do that is that we have a structured protocol in place for case review. Um, so this is really helpful, especially for newer employees. Sometimes people don't know how to use supervision. I remember um, early in my career, I go into my supervision and I I had no idea what I was supposed to talk about. <laughs> like, what do I say? How, what is the what is the structure for discussing my clients? So think about what you do in supervision um, and how do you communicate that to staff and advocates, reviewing cases, debriefing the day, um, and talking about other work-related tasks as well. Make sure you're communicating that protocol. Another suggestion is to prevent what's called top-down leadership. Uh, so this is when people at the top, the directors, the supervisors, they're calling the shots essentially um, and uh, making decisions, which of course is part of their job. It's what they do. Um, but sometimes what can happen is that they fail to check in with direct service staff to ask them, well, what would be helpful to you? What's your experience? Um, another way that we see this is that direct service staff might come to supervisor or manager and say, hey, this really isn't working for us. Is, is, can we change this? Or here's my suggestion, because this is what I do every single day. Um, and the supervisor or the manager might sort of shut that down and invalidate the suggestion that's being made. Um, so this can happen unintentionally and certainly can happen intentionally, but I encourage you to think about what this looks like in your organization. So how do you make space for direct service staff to share their knowledge, to share their experience and to feel heard, of course. Uh, quality supervision also includes appreciation. Um, so really taking time to express gratitude uh, and also responding to any needs or requests they have, uh, responding in a timely manner and responding in a respectful way. We also want to support, um, or, I'm sorry, foster supportive relationships based on inclusivity, mutual respect and trust. <clears throat> and that can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, depending on um, what they're asking for, what their needs are, and what their previous experience is. So I want to take just a moment to talk a bit more about that and relate it to what's called culturally responsive leadership. So this actually comes from um, some resources from Wixap. So, um, you know, I am not the expert on um, this um, topic by any means, and I just want to name that this information doesn't come from me. This comes from Wixap, looking at best practices and looking at the data. Uh, so I encourage you to check out their resources to learn more. Oh, Michelle wrote that. Awesome. <laughs> so let's give credit to Michelle here. Um, so what I want to focus on in terms of culturally responsive leadership is to think about advocates and staff of color. We know that these folks have compounding effects on their experiences with vicarious trauma that make them potentially more vulnerable depending on um, their community and their day-to-day -day lived experiences. We know as a uh, truth that racist interactions, discrimination, experiences of oppression, stereotype, they are likely to occur before, during, after work hours. And so it's important to note that during the workday, um, they are not shielded from these negative interactions. During the workday, there might be microaggressions from their peers, their colleagues, potentially from their manager or their supervisor. Um, they might also experience um, microaggressions or blatantly racist interactions with survivors that they're serving. Um, and of course, these interactions can happen on their way to work, as they leave work um, and, and any other time as well. So they're, they're navigating the world, mitigating and trying to mitigate the effects of these interactions. And as a supervisor, it's important to note that, to think about how this might impact their experience within your organization. 
So sometimes these folks will come to you with concerns, suggestions based on their lived experience. They might come to you as any other um, staff or advocate might come to you to talk about issues with, um, with peers, with colleagues. And the suggestion is to lead with curiosity and respect. Pretty simple, right? And it's kind of like a no duh, but as human beings, we're not always so great with this. Uh, we tend to jump to conclusions. We tend to want to just fix it, make everything better. Um, and sometimes because we're not coming to these uh, dialogues or these conversations with an open mind, um, we can really lead to minimizing an experience. So check yourself, um, don't insert your own beliefs, don't try to fix it, um, don't say things like, well, let's see how it unfolds, or I'm sure they didn't mean it that way. Um, these are very invalidating and minimizing uh, statements to make. Rather, of course, respect their lived experiences, um, ask them how it is for them, what they need from you, um, follow their lead if they're willing to offer that. Um, and of course, uh, we always want to check ourselves before we um, put words in someone's mouth or say, I know, I know how to fix this, I know how to resolve this. We also want to build awareness around power imbalances, um, even unintentionally. Uh, we can have abuses of power. Naturally, when there's a supervisor, a manager, um, and an advocate um, or staff, there's a, there is that natural hierarchy that can, can come into play. So we want to build awareness into how that's affecting advocates and staff, particularly those of color. Notice retention issues. Um, are advocates of staff of color, are they leaving regularly? Do you have trouble? Um, keeping them uh, on as employees for very long? If so, you should probably be questioning how you're supporting those folks and how you can do a better job. Um, and this is specifically for um, staff and advocates uh, with English as their second language. Regularly check in, um, ask um, if, if comprehension is um, matching the context. So there might be some extra information, context building, some information to fill in um, for someone who is ESL and um, check in with them regularly, often, particularly if they're new in the organization. Um, you want to make sure that nothing is getting lost, uh, that they are well aware of their work role um, and well aware of how they can access support as well. Um, so Susan uh, puts uh, another resource in the chat box um, to assess your organization's response to vicarious trauma. I'm very interesting to uh, engage in some of, uh, some of your own reflection and maybe get some feedback there in a survey. Um, so again, uh, the information from this slide comes from WixApp itself, and there's certainly some very good literature and data on culturally responsive leadership. So I encourage you um, to dig into that, to take time to read about that, think about that, and uh, maybe even consult with other supervisors and managers to check in about how you're doing. So back to some um, more general suggestions here. We know, um, of course, training and professional development, these are really important aspects. Um, we want staff and advocates to feel confident and we also want them to be competent. Um, when they feel these things, it can buffer them from experiencing things like vicarious trauma because they might be more likely to, to be able to set boundaries um, when they're feeling competent and confident, they're not having to overuse energy to um, meet the demands of their job. And of course, we also want to offer training specific to vicarious trauma. As I mentioned earlier, we wanna build their capacity to check in with themselves and build awareness around their own warning signs. It's important for them to 
um, recognize these warning signs so hopefully they can take some breaks and intervene and engage in self-care. It's also helpful though for them to know about these warning signs and consequences in case they're noticing them in their peers, um, in their colleagues. We want staff to check in with each other. Um, in terms of self-care and self, uh, staff wellness, <clears throat> I encourage you to devote time and resources to promoting staff well-being. Um, so thinking about policies and practices, what is built in day to day in your organizational structure that allows staff to practice wellness? So that could be um, really focused on taking breaks and having that scheduled in someone's calendar. Um, another option um, here in this last bullet point is creating staff support groups. Um, some of you mentioned in the chat that you had the clinical staff meeting together regularly. Um, and that's something that I'm guessing is in the calendar. Um, they plan for it every week or every other week, whatever it is. Something where they can connect with each other and support each other in the work that they do. So it's one thing to harp on self care, to encourage it. It's another thing to build that into policies and practices so that the organization is following through with that encouragement. Uh, it's far too easy to override our need for self care and to just keep going, 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 especially when we're so committed to the work that we do. So it's very helpful to have structure in place that allows us to take breaks, reminds us to take breaks. Um, uh, and Noreen is naming some other ways to practice self-care and staff wellness, weekly staff talking circles, monthly retreats, ceremonial leave. I love this, just uh, recognizing that we can do it um, every day, every week, every month, we can build in self-care and staff support. Um, all really important considerations. So um, closing things up and we have some time for other comments and questions as well, but just to finalize some of this information, we know vicarious trauma is common, it's likely to show up. So we need to be paying attention to it and the impact can be mild um, to significant to really causing challenges in one's personal and professional life. Organizations can make a big difference. It can mitigate the presence of vicarious trauma. It can decrease the severity of it. It can lessen the time one is in that place of burnout. So um, managers, supervisors, and directors, you really have um, a great opportunity here to support your staff when you're thinking about vicarious trauma. Um, and that's, um, the research shows us that it can make all the difference when staff perceive the organization as being supportive. So final questions, comments, um, Michelle's naming COVID has helped us rethink bereavement and sick leave. Yeah, having to get uh, creative and think outside of the box um, in terms of how we support people and leave, taking time off. Any other comments, questions to name at the end of today? Okay. So I just want to say thank you all for being here again. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure to share this information with you this afternoon and I'm so grateful that you all think it's important enough to come to a workshop and learn more about vicarious trauma. That says a lot about um, you as an organization already that you're here. Um, so thanks for your time. This is my contact info if you want to get in touch with me with questions or feedback. Um, and you can see that there's some chat and about uh, copies of the PowerPoint and such. I'll let Susan um, share some more information about that. Thank you all. Yes. Um, yeah. So we have I have copies of the PowerPoint and we're recording this video so we can send all of that out. You'll also get um, an a link to an evaluation if you could fill that out after the webinar um, that helps us do better and it can be anything from content to logistics 